The new leader of the Iowa Democratic Party has her work cut out for her to try to get Democrats winning again. We sit down with Chair Rita Hart on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Elite Casino Resorts is rooted in Iowa. Elite was founded 30 years ago in Dubuque and owned by 1,200 Iowans from more than 45 counties. With resorts in Riverside, Davenport, and Larchwood, Iowa, Elite is committed to the communities we serve. Across Iowa, hundreds of neighborhood banks strive to serve their communities, provide jobs, and help local businesses. Iowa banks are proud to back the life you build. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you political leaders and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond, celebrating 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, March 10th edition of Iowa Press. Here is Kay Henderson. Our guest on this edition of Iowa Press is a former state senator, a former candidate for lieutenant governor in 2018, a former congressional candidate in 2020, and earlier this year was elected to lead the Iowa Democratic Party. Rita Hart is a farmer from Wheatland. Welcome to Iowa Press. Well, thank you, Kay. Happy to be here. Also joining the conversation, Aaron Murphy, the Des Moines Bureau Chief for the Gazette in Cedar Rapids. So, Rita, shortly after that election to the state party chair, uh, within about a week, the national party made it official and uh, stripped your party's caucuses uh, of their first in the nation status. So we wanted to start with, tell us, what is the next step for Iowa Democrats regarding their caucuses? Well, I want to be clear about that. You know, the um, out in Philadelphia, they passed a resolution that uh, did create a, the first in the nation um, slate of, of states, and Iowa's not on it. But, but um, it's not a done deal. Um, you said, what do you mean by that? Why, why is it not done? It seems like a fairly done deal <laughs> to everybody outside of Iowa. Why do you not well, consider it a done deal? Well, it's interesting because, um, you know, things are taking place that, that one entity doesn't have control of over the other entity. So, for example, um, Iowa has a state law that we, that we need to follow. And, uh, and New Hampshire has a state law that they need to follow. And, and, and Georgia has to... Um, they've been granted a waiver, but um, that's, that, there has to be action taken um, in order for that uh, to actually become reality. And on the Republican side of things, they're facing challenges on their um, end, too, with uh, Nevada and Michigan. And, and again, um, those conversations are still taking place. And so, so uh, we are um, intent on continuing these conversations. It's a, it's a happy thing that here's an, an issue that both Republicans and Democrats in Iowa are definitely in sync on. And so um, I look forward to continue to work with the, with the Republicans and, and continue to uh, make the case for Iowa um, as we um, see what happens next. So a little less than a year from now when Iowa Democrats meet for those caucuses, what is that going to look like? What what will you do, and will that include the party stating their presidential preference? So we'll see what what happens. We you know we'll we'll go through this process, and we'll see you know in in June this might look a little different. In August it might look a little different than that. And so we'll continue to uh, monitor that and to work with folks and continue to have those conversations. I want to remind you you know that um, this process has been going on a long time already. Um, Scott Brennan and others have been doing a great job for making the the Iowa case for almost two years now, and and so we'll continue to do that. One thing that I'm uh, happy about, though, is that um, we are going to put in a new process. No matter no matter when the caucuses take place, we're going to revamp um, the way um, Democrats in Iowa indicate their presidential preference. And so we're uh, moving forward on that no matter what. And I think that that's such a, such a positive thing for us, that we're creating a process that more people can participate in. Um, it's going to be a mail-in process where people, um, Democrats, indicate that they want a, 
to, to make a presidential preference, so they'll receive a card in the mail, and then they'll have a certain time period to return that. And, uh, and that's going to open that up, again, to be much more accessible to folks, you know, people who have not been able to participate before, people who work third shift, people with small children, um, people who are more homebound for whatever reason. Um, this is going to be perhaps the most accessible uh, process um, in the entire nation. So we're excited about that, and we'll continue to work towards that, uh, um, making that reality. So how do you pre prevent someone from mailing in a quote-unquote presidential preference card and then also attending the Iowa Republican Party caucuses on caucus night? So that's a good question, Kay. <laughs> I think that that's something we, we'll of course, have to be uh, uh, diligent on. And, uh, and there, that is not, all the details here have not been worked out. Um, but we're going to take a very thoughtful approach to that. We're going to work with the Republicans on that. We're going to um, um, use the technology that's available. And we're going to make sure that this process is secure. So let's say you are unsuccessful in getting the Democratic National Committee to change the rules. And so South Carolina goes first, New Hampshire goes second, uh, Michigan, and I guess Nevada goes third, and then Michigan. What happens then if you folks say, I don't care, I have the caucuses, are you willing to give up having delegates at the Democratic National Convention, which is one of the sanctions? So I think this is a, a conversation that um, is not, we're not looking at that right now. And so again, this is not a done deal. We're not um, in that situation as of yet. I think there's a lot of opinions about this. Um, and uh, so I'm going to continue to um, uh, work with Republicans to make sure that we're doing what's best for Iowa. And um, if we are faced with things like that, I'm going to listen to um, a lot of uh, Democratic voices on what, what they think is the right thing to do going forward. You talked a little bit about the, the new mail-in presidential preference system. We wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. Uh, and you mentioned the security. That was one of our questions. How do you ensure, and this is a new process, obviously, what are the plans to have in place uh, uh, what are the systems that will be in place to ensure that it's secure and that you have accurate results to um, report that night? And um, also, what are the costs associated with this? Have, has that been determined yet? So, yeah, we're just getting started on, on looking at all of those things. We're, um, we're, we're going to look at, um, we actually um, are soliciting some, um, some groups that actually do this, that um, have expertise in this, that have a, have a history of, of understanding how to conduct such a mail-in campaign. And so um, we're just getting started in that process. And uh, we'll see, um, um, first of all, how long it's going to take to get that process, uh, to get that, um, to find out what uh, is possible, but um, and, it's important that we do it right. And I don't want to trigger any bad memories, but will this involve an <laughs> app uh, of, of some kind? Um, <laughs> you know, again, we've, we are, we're going to do the very best job that we can to be as prepared as possible. Um, and I have confidence that there are entities out there that can help us do this in a very secure fashion. Well, let's say the Iowa caucuses are on a first week of February next year on both the Democratic and Republican sides. Do you start mail-in voting on that night or are you going to start it in January? I mean, what's the schedule here or is that still in flux? That's still in flux as well, but I, I would anticipate that it will start before that. Um, and then, we'll, you know, we'll see what kind of, as it gets closer, as these decisions are made, as, as we know the, the situation that we're dealing with, we'll make that decision. Couldn't you sort of abide by party rules by starting on caucus night and then announcing the results after these other early states are done? I think there's all kinds of possibilities Is here. that something you're considering? I, I'm not considering anything because I'm <laughs> considering that we're going to see what happens here with these other states and see what's possible. But, but a lot of those ideas have been bandied about. I think we're going to be listening to all of them. So there are voices in your party who say, enough already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We should be done with these things. They're not helping us be successful at the state level. What's your answer to those people who say, this is just wasted motion. Let's get on with the business of electing Iowa Democrats to Iowa offices. Well, I, I want to be clear that 
That is the main job, is to elect more Democrats. That's my job as the head of the party, and that is, that is all of my focus. And, uh, and so I would say to them that, um, that we have got that as priority number one, and nothing is going to get in the way of that. So speaking of that in electing more Iowa Democrats, the party is coming off a string of uh, tough election cycles with maybe the exception of uh, some mixed results in 2018, but the, the other recent cycles have, have not been overly successful for the party. Part of, I think, digging out of a hole is figuring out why you're in the hole in the first place. How much of that has taken place, and in, in, in your view, and in, in what you know, having been around this state, why are Iowa Democrats in this hole now? It's a great question, and I think you'll find lots of answers mm -hmm. to that. And yeah, I think that there has been a lot of soul searching, and rightly so, right? Um, I think that, uh, that uh, politics in general is interesting to all kinds of folks, and so you're seeing um, that kind of question being ex asked by many, and a lot of research has gone into this, I think. Uh, me personally, um, I've, I've read as much as I can about um, what research has been done on this. I think it's clear and I think Democrats um, recognize how clear it is. I think that's one reason why I got a lot of um, uh, encouragement to run for the state chair position because we know that for one thing we've got to do better in rural Iowa. We've got to be, do better in these rural counties and that Democrats have, um, have um, suffered um, from an image problem, and a um, and we've got to concentrate more on grassroots efforts there, um, and I think that's why they were encouraging to me to to vote for, to have the leader of the party who lives on a farm, who is who is a farmer, um, who lives in a county that voted for Obama twice, and and then flipped and voted for um, for um, Trump twice, um, to. Um, to have, uh, to have my background of being very much a champion of our small towns, of our rural, rural areas, of working on the rural economy with the local um, community uh, members to make a difference, that is the kind of uh, message that we have to get as a party to all of rural counties, that, that we are the party of the working class, that we always have been, and that, that we are really um, taking that um, very seriously. But then there are, there are other issues, too, you know, that, um, that we have to concentrate on. We've, gotta, we've um, basically got to take a look at the entire structure, but I really think um, if we do a, a much better job um, with our grassroots efforts, we're going we're gonna to see some elections turn around for us. So for viewers who aren't familiar, Wheatland is in Clinton County. Correct. The city of Clinton used to be a big Democratic stronghold, along with places like Ottumwa and Dubuque and Fort Madison. Those places have been lost to Democrats. It's not just rural Iowa. It's mid-sized cities in Iowa. So how do you reach voters there who've left your party? I don't know if they have left the party as they have just been, you know, disillusioned, right? And then they're looking for, for change, looking for something else. Um, and so you win those people back by connecting with them, by listening to them, by um, having these conversations, and by fighting for the things that they care about. Um, for instance, you know, right now, I think it's very troubling to um, all of us who live in rural Iowa that... Um, that we've got um, a Republican trifecta in the legislature that has uh, gone after public schools by taking taxpayer money and putting into, into private schools. Um, that's, that is concerning to everybody who lives in a small town and knows how important these public school systems are to keeping our towns alive. Um, we have to... Um, talk to them and, and, and listen to them about how important it is that they have the health care services that they need. You know, I'm always struck by the fact that, you know, I'm lucky. I live, in, I live, eight, I live four miles outside a little town of Wheatland has a, that has a grocery store where I can buy fresh meat and a head of lettuce, right? Most of our small towns um, don't have that luxury, and that should not be a luxury. So these are the kinds of issues that we need to be out um, talking to our, our fellow Democrats in these rural counties. So I do want to circle back. 
Governor Kim Reynolds made no secret of the fact that education savings accounts that are state funded for private school parents to cover private school expenses were priority number one for her and she won significantly. She campaigned for legislative candidates um, who shared that vision. Why did then rural Iowa vote for Kim Reynolds and all of these legislators? It is a curious matter, but I think part of that is the way we get um, our information, right? Um, she didn't come to um, rural Iowa and say, hey, I'm going to take your taxpayer money um, and put it in these, in these private schools. Um, specifically to them, she talked about other things, and they get their information in, um, and I do think that there is a big emphasis on the national messaging, and, and that's where, you know, we have, um, it's harder to combat a national message that is emphasizing other things that perhaps take, take center front. Uh, for these um, voters out in rural Iowa. So it's a, it's a task that, is, that we have to take very seriously on where the information is coming from and, and what is the message that they're receiving. You have uh, colleagues in neighboring, similar Midwest states that have had more success at the statewide level with the Democratic Party uh, just to the north and, and northeast in Minnesota and Wisconsin. They've elected Democratic governors recently. Are there any lessons in, in what has taken place there? You said you've done research. Is there, is there any lesson to take from Minnesota and Wisconsin, or is it, is it as simple as are the demographics more favorable uh, there with the Twin Cities and, and Madison and Milwaukee? Are there just higher shares of Democratic voters in those two states? Uh, is there anything to be learned there? I think there is lessons to be learned there, and I'm, I'm having those conversations with the folks in, in Minnesota and Wisconsin. I think those are important conversations to have. We can learn a lot from success, and um, they have seen success lately. Um, and so we'll continue to um, have those conversations and pick up, you know, the states still are, you know, they're very much alike, and yet they're very, very different. And so. Um, we're, we're going to uh, keep that Iowa flair, recognize the, um, the challenges that we face here in Iowa that, that are not similar to Minnesota and Wisconsin, and yet um, we definitely want to, uh, to look at um, what has been working well elsewhere. Are there just uh, along those lines, are there enough Democratic voters left in Iowa to win these statewide races? It's been since Senator Harkin's last victory that Iowa, an Iowa Democrat won a race for either Senate or governor. Um, they've won some statewide office races, but at the top of the ticket. Um, is, are there just not enough voters in Iowa City and Des Moines anymore to, to carry a, a Democrat at the top of the ticket? Again, I, I think if you look at registration across Iowa, we're still a third, a third, a third, right? Um, there's plenty of hope here. <laughs> um, and it just makes, uh, makes the, the job that much more interesting to recognize that this is, um, this is something we have to work at and that we have to learn from our mistakes and we have to uh, make sure that we're doing something every single day that's going to um, make our case to the people of Iowa. You know, as we look at the, the issues that, that Democrats really care about, that we are talking about Main Street, Iowa, those are the, the issues that we want to talk about, the, the issues that matter to uh, people who are working hard every day, people who are looking for better child care solutions, people who are um, making sure that their parents can remain out in rural Iowa when the, the closest hospital is in danger of being, being uh, um, closed. Those are the things that um, we've got to make our case with and I, I think we've seen politics turn on a dime here in Iowa and so I, that's, that's maybe why people like politics, you know, that, that there's always drama involved and what's going to happen around the corner. So we're going we're gonna to work hard to make sure that we make change happen. President Biden hasn't yet officially announced he plans to seek re-election but the expectation is he will, should he campaign here? And also in the context of the 2024 campaign, what's your message to candidates you're trying to recruit to run on the Iowa ballot? So the message is that Democrats have a lot to be proud of here. You know, um, President Biden has provided us with a string of 
of uh, victories, um, with especially with a strong infrastructure bill that is really making uh, a difference here to Iowa, to Iowans. Um, we, he has a strong record of delivering um, for, the, for, for the people of the nation, and that's no different here in the state of Iowa. And so that's the case that I'm going to be making with um, anybody who is um, intending to run, that this is the time. And I think that, you know, most people in Iowa are not that political, right? They have jobs to do. They're busy. They've got kids to take care of. And, and they want to be good citizens, and they want to be, they want to, um, be knowledgeable to go into the voting booth and make a good choice. But they really are counting on the rest of us to do the hard work of the, of the um, political process here. And so um, that's, the, that's when you have good candidates who truly have the people in mind. You've got candidates who do put people over politics. That's what speaks to all of us. And I think that's what's going to make a difference. And if we can get good candidates like that, and, and if we can encourage those people who have their priorities straight to run for office, we're going to, have, we're going to start winning some elections. So those good candidates, if you're able to get them, will have to run against sometimes um, political messaging that can make it tough for Democrats um, uh, the latest example is the Republicans using the term woke as uh, as an attack on Democrats and, and acknowledging here that that word is probably now defined differently by different people and, and not even remotely close to what it was originally intended to be. But as far as a, it is still a very real impact in elections and, and political messaging and getting through to those voters who, as you noted, aren't necessarily tuned into everything 24-7 like some of us are. How do... Iowa Democrats in particular, for lack of a better way to put it, win that political messaging battle and get through to voters uh, in a way that you think would make your candidates more successful? Well, it's not easy. I mean, that's why not everybody gets into this business, right? <laughs> but it's so important, right? And so, you know, I think this is another example of taking a, a concept that is really based in in good policy in that social justice is important to all of us. Justice is something that we all want. It's a basic human value that we, that we hold high. And so when we're having this conversation around a word and try to turn it into a negative thing, when the concept is based in in something that uh, people do value, I think that's when we get, you know, that's when people get turned off on politics, right? And you start bandying those words about and labeling people accordingly. People get quickly tired of that and 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 don't have time to to mess around with that concept. So, again, you know, it's about proving, you know, the proof is always in the pudding, right? That. Um, You've got to get out there and get involved. You've got to um, talk about the things that truly matter to people and be the kind of person, be the kind of candidate, be the kind of leader that truly has the interests of everybody in mind, not just the well-off, not just the well-connected, not just the people who are greasing the wheels, but everybody in the state of Iowa. And, and that's what people are looking for. To put a finer point on it, how do you respond to Republicans who say, Republicans, I mean Democrats, don't share your values. Oh, I, I would you know, say, like parental rights. That's um, the watchword at the Capitol this year. Sure, and I guess my response to that is that's just simply poppycock, right? <laughs> um, people, Democrats care about parental rights, and and I think that that has been in the fabric of the institutions we're talking about, right? Every, that's what local school boards are all about, right? That's why you have school boards, because they are, they are parents, they are community members, and they have meetings and they invite parents to come to those meetings and talk, talk to them, and, and they do influence the actions of a board and of an administration. That is crucial to our public education system. So to think that Democrats don't care about that is, is just simply nonsense. We have about a minute left. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, in 2018 and 2020, you were on the ballot but didn't win. What does that perspective bring to your current job 
that you think informs the way you will guide the party? Well, I, I can be really honest in saying that was a really tough experience, right? You know, it, uh, we worked really very hard and then there was, um, I mean, who goes into a congressional race thinking, oh, I'm going to end up in the record books as, as being in one of the closest races in all of U.S. history, right? So it wasn't an easy um, task, and, but, but it, um, it just did nothing but um, solidify my belief that, that um, we have got to keep putting one foot ahead of the other and, um, and that people um, want good leadership and um, and it's it's my job as if I'm going to step into this role as the chair of the Democratic Party, is to be part of a um, situation where we can agree to disagree, where we can bring um, bring a notion of of civility back into politics, that um, that pe good people can do that as long as we lock hands and say, yes, we're going to, we're going to maybe come from different places on this, but we're going to end up in a good place because we're going to do this for, um, for the good people of Iowa. Speaking of ending up, our conversation <laughs> is, has concluded for this edition of Iowa Press. Rita Hart, thank you for joining hey, us. Hey, thank you so much. It was a great pleasure. On behalf of everyone at Iowa Press, thanks for watching. You can find Iowa Press episodes online at iowapbs.org. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Elite Casino Resorts is rooted in Iowa. Elite was founded 30 years ago in Dubuque and owned by 1,200 Iowans from more than 45 counties. With resorts in Riverside, Davenport, and Larchwood, Iowa, Elite is committed to the communities we serve. Across Iowa, hundreds of neighborhood banks strive to serve their communities, provide jobs, and help local businesses. Iowa banks are proud to back the life you build. Learn more at iowabankers.com.